Hi, everyone. We're just going to give people a couple more minutes to join. Okay, hi everyone, this is Michaela Andriach. I'm a legal fellow here at UNHCR working under Lindsay Jenkins. Um, thank you so much for tuning into this webinar called Representing Stateless People Before US Immigration Authorities Motions to Reopen. We really appreciate all the work you're doing for stateless persons and we're happy that you could join us today. Um, I just wanna go over a few technical things before we get into the presentations. So first of all, on the right side of your screen, you should see a section called handouts. And in this section, you'll see a few different resources, um, copies of both of the presentations for today, and then UNHCR's legal representation manual, our handbook on the protection of stateless people, and our Citizens of Nowhere report. And then right around where the handout section is, you should see a box for questions. So feel free to ask questions throughout the presentations and we will get to them at the end and we'll be able to answer those and then if you're having any issues there's also a chat box that i'll be monitoring so you can um, comment in there if you need some assistance um okay so lindsay jenkins is going to be starting lindsay is a protection officer with unhcr unhcr's regional office in washington's protection and solutions team where her work focuses on issues of access to asylum, protections for those fleeing violence in the north of Central America, capacity building and statelessness among others. Prior to joining UNHCR, Lindsay provided legal orientation and representation to adults and families held in US immigration detention. She was also a Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras and speaks Spanish. So I'm gonna hand it over to you, Lindsay. Okay, hey, thanks. Um, good morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, my name is Lindsay Jenkins, and I will be taking us through the first portion of our webinar this morning, um, after which we will be in, uh, joined by the wonderful team up at Catholic Charities in New York to kind of dig in on some of the substance of one of the specific areas of US immigration law that we'll focus in on, which are motions to reopen. My job this morning is to um, is to provide uh, an overview, um, set the stage really for discussing statelessness as it comes up in the context of um, of U.S. immigration law and um, specifically within the motions to reopen context. Um, statelessness, as many of you know, is um, is a, an issue that affects nearly 10 million people, an estimated 10 million people around the world, um, a currently unknown number of which are here in the United States. But we do know that there is a um, significant population of folks who have come here um, and are residing and um, living in the United States. Um, under a situation where they have no nationality or citizenship in, in any country. Um, I will be discussing a bit about how that happens, some of the hardships folks face, and some of the ways and start presenting the ways that, um, that, that this could come up in immigration cases. Um, UNHCR, as you all know, is the UN Refugee Agency, but it is perhaps a little less known that we also have um, the authority to work with governments, um, civil society, and stateless people around the world to, um, to, to end statelessness and to, um, to also provide protections for stateless people. So our work generally, the world over, falls into four big categories, which is the identification of statelessness, the prevention of statelessness, and the reduction of existing cases of statelessness, and also, again, the protection of the rights of stateless persons advocating for um, for their rights and for solutions. Okay, so we'll start out here with a definition of a stateless person, and this is pulled directly from the 1954 convention related to the status of stateless persons. 
Um, Article one, and for those of you who are very who are familiar with the Refugee Convention, the 1951 Refugee Convention, where um, a refugee is defined in Article one, very similar in um, in the 1954 Statelessness Convention, the um, the term a stateless person is is defined, and that's um, specifically a person who is not considered as a national or a citizen by any state under the operation of its laws. Um, the 1954 convention also defines um, beyond defining this, uh, the defin defining a, a stateless person. It also sets out a number of rights and obligations of stateless peoples, and then it's also um, complemented by a 1961 convention um, on the reduction of statelessness that really digs in more on um, the responsibilities of states towards um, towards stateless people and ending situations of statelessness. But the 1954 convention thereby establishes um, a, an internationally recognized definition of who is a stateless person. And it seems pretty straightforward from a definition, but um, for all of the lawyers on the line, I think you know uh, this. Um, there are a lot of terms in here that can be interpreted and are interpreted and can get complicated. Um, and so we'll, we'll go down that path and discuss that a little bit moving on. But, um, but generally speaking, the question of who is a stateless person and who meets that definition is a mixed question of law and fact. Um, we're looking at every, um, every piece of, every element of that definition, um, looking at, um, for instance, um, the, the phrase any state, that is an inquiry to, um, that is limited to those states where someone has a relevant link, so we need to start looking for relevant links. We're looking at law um, under the under the operation of its law. So we're looking to a range of different um, sources, not just legislation, but also ministerial decrees, regulations, etc. And not considered as a national um, requires a very careful analysis of how a state applies its nationality laws in practice. So you can see from the start, as we as we set out the definition, it seems pretty straightforward. But there is a great deal of interpretation that goes into each of the, uh, the elements of that definition. Now, taking a step back, um, thinking about statelessness and where, um, the, uh, where the authorities list, where is the framework for, um, for um, the legal definition of statelessness and the protections that exist under international law. So I've already mentioned the 1954 convention relating to the status of stateless persons and the 1961 convention around the reduction of statelessness. But um, the question of, um, of statelessness actually also lives in, um, in a range of other international human rights um, documents that complement that framework. For instance, you have Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that discusses the, the right to a nationality. Um, you also have Article 24 of the ICCPR, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as Article 7 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child that establish the right of a child to acquire a nationality at birth. Additionally, you have prohibitions on um, discrimination in acquisition or um, deprivation of nationality that live within the, um, the ICCPR again, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, or the CERD, as well as the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW. So really, while the definition of a stateless person lives in that uh, 1954 convention and then some of the responsibilities of states um, live in the 1961 conventions, really um, the, the right to nationality and the protections that, that exist there from are, are actually very much sprinkled throughout the entire international human rights framework um, and can be founded in a range of different arguments um, and, and when we're looking at the importance of the rights at stake. So what causes statelessness? How does someone become stateless? How is it that someone in 2018 is living without, um, without citizenship, without nationality, without uh, a tie to a, to a country to, to call their own and protect them? Well, there are a range of different ways that this emerges. Um, one might be um, conflicts or gaps in various nationality laws, particularly when 
um, when a child has parents from, um, from two different countries who have citizenship or maybe not of two different countries. Additionally, you have um, on the books uh, discriminatory nationality laws, nationality laws that discriminate um, on in their ability to, um, a parent's ability to convey nationality based on, um, on say, gender or their, their uh, race or ethnicity. Um, one of the things that we point to is that there are currently around 26 countries in the world um, that actually discriminate um, uh, have dis discriminatory provisions within their laws that do not allow women to convey nationality um, to their children on the same basis as men. Um, and so that, uh, that oftentimes can lead to a child being born stateless um, without a nationality if the, if the child is otherwise unable to obtain nationality through the, through the father. Beyond that, we also have emergence of new states and changes in borders. Um, when you have situations of state succession, um, where a country that once existed ceases to exist um, or divides, we um, one of probably the um, most frequent populations that we work with of stateless people here in the United States are um, individuals who are um, who are formerly citizens of the. Soviet Union who were here in the United States um, or elsewhere when um, when the USSR broke apart and they were unable to satisfy the subsequent residency requirements or other requirements to prove nationality in the new state that emerged and so they were left without a without a nationality and then finally to loss or deprivation of nationality um, this could come in an individual case this could come on a group basis and we've seen in this hemisphere um, uh, groups of people who were previously recognized as citizens being stripped of their nationality based on legal developments or court interpretations. This is particularly true in, um, in the Dominican Republic where we saw um, large numbers of, um, of people stripped of their nationality based on a 2013 constitutional court decision. So there are a range of different ways that, um, that individuals can, um, can end up in a situation of statelessness. Um, without a country. Sometimes folks are very aware of this and sometimes they aren't aware of it until it becomes an issue uh, in, in, their, um, in their immigration case or whatnot. But it's very important to understand that there are a range of different ways that, um, that it can arise and, um, and can affect um, an individual in, in our country. So going back to that, um, that initial definition of a stateless person, someone who is not considered a national um, under the operation of, by any country under the operation of its laws. Again, that is um, a legal definition and it is one um, that requires a great deal of interpretation. Um, over the years, and uh, we have UNHCR has through consultations with experts and, um, and through our own experience with identifying stateless individuals. We've developed um, what you see on your screen now is the Handbook on the Protection of Stateless Persons. And so those of you uh, who represent asylum seekers and refugees may be familiar with UNHCR's um, Handbook, on, um, uh, Handbook on Refugee Status Determinations. This is very similar to that, except it applies the, it looks at both the, um, the legal and procedural standards that should be in place in order to um, conduct a specific determination in an individual case to look at whether or not someone is actually stateless. There are many people who, um, who are stateless. There are many people who are um, potentially in very similar situations but are not themselves stateless. And so we really, UNHCR, sought to work with, uh, with governments and other experts around the world to really define who a stateless person is and provide some procedural and um, interpretive guidance on how to go about that. So as you can see, um, you, there are three uh, parts to our handbook. There's one looking at the criteria for determining statelessness. And so really that's examining the definition, how it should be applied, all of those elements that I was referring to earlier. Um, I won't go into all of them right now. You all can access them um, via our website and you'll also be receiving a follow-up email that I'll have a link. Um, if you don't have that link already to the handbook, but it's very helpful. Um, part two describes the procedures for the determination of statelessness. And this 
includes um, this includes a range of different guidance to um, to help you understand what an adjudicator how a procedure should be carried out and what an adjudicator might be looked at, looking at. Actually, part one and part two together really do that. Um, they provide everything um, that to guide the adjudicator in understanding the evaluation of the application of these laws, you know, country-specific laws and practice, including the extent to which judicial decisions and, and laws are actually respected by government officials. It, it delves into the kinds of evidence that may be relevant um, in determining um, statelessness in a particular case. So evidence about an individual's circumstances or evidence concerning the laws and other circumstances in the country in question that, that may actually um, influence whether or not that person is stateless. Um, and so it's important to note as you go through this, the part three refers to the status of stateless persons at the national level. Um, thinking about the, the US context, and in particular, I should note, it's important to note that the United States is not a state party to either the 1954 Statelessness Convention nor the 61 um, on reduction of statelessness. However, um, you know, there are very clear principles that, that, that could apply in the context of the US and the principles in this, um, in this handbook will help guide attorneys in thinking through how to determine whether someone sitting across the table from you for a consult is actually stateless and how you prove that um, to a court of law, how you would present that argument either to, um, to administrative authorities or to um, or in other legal arguments that you might want to present in an individual case. So this is actually a very helpful tool for understanding how to evaluate statelessness and present, uh, make the argument that um, uh, present evidence and make the argument that your client actually is stateless to um, to authorities. Very quickly here is just um, a quick overview of um, a map that is a little bit dated at this point. It's from 2016, but does include, it kind of gives you a sense of where um, some of the major situations of statelessness are around the world. This is from the US State Department. It's not a UNHCR document, but it does actually give a bit of insight into um, into uh, where um, you know you might see large populations of stateless people um, coming from, originating from. Now that could be that you know it's important to note that some stateless people are actually in the country where they were born. They still reside in the country where they were born, and so that might be reflected here. There are other um, individuals who have migrated um, either. Uh, under circumstances of forced migration. So they're actually stateless refugees living in other countries. Um, so that might be other situations or maybe they've migrated for other reasons. But this kind of helps you get a sense. Um, it could be a good touchstone to take a look and think about if if you think an, an, a situation might be coming up. These are some of the, the areas of the world that, that, might, um, that you might see statelessness originating from in your client base. Okay, shifting now to the United States um, and the right to nationality and treatment in U.S. law. Um, as we mentioned, the U.S. Un uh, is not a um, state party to either the 54 or 61 statelessness conventions, but there are, we would say, um, very strong safeguards that exist currently under U.S. Um, under U.S. law um, that prevent um, new situations of statelessness, that prevent children from being born stateless, that prevent um, long-term protracted situations of statelessness. It's really is, round, is grounded in the 14th Amendment um, and um, the idea that any child born in U.S. territory is automatically a U.S. citizen. Um, I have here, you'll see on your screen, um, the idea of jus soli. There are two ways. All nationality laws can be divided into essentially two types. One is jus soli, which means um, nationality law that is based on, on where you are actually physically born, and jus sanguine, um, based on um, who your parents are um, and whether they were able to convey. So not only um, does the 14th Amendment provide that any child born in U.S. territory is a U.S. citizen, strong safeguards currently, um, but also there are safeguards within the law um, protecting children born abroad to U.S. citizens that are also eligible for U.S. citizenship. Um, there have been, um, obviously, there are various permutations of, um, of how, of, of circumstances of children born abroad to 
uh, a U.S. citizen, perhaps, um, you know, the other one parent has U.S. citizenship and one does not. And there are some um, some issues that have arisen in, in that context that um, the child is of questionable nationality. But um, at the very least, for children born abroad to two U.S. citizen parents um, provided meet certain circumstances, there are um, protections for, um, for children not being born stateless. So now we're going to start shifting gears. Um, you know, one thing it's important to note that um, there is no definition of a stateless person under U.S. law. Um, so this is actually, as I mentioned before, you know, so we don't have a large, because of those safeguards that are on the books um, protecting children from being born stateless in the United States, you don't have a large native born U.S. Um, statelessness population. It's not an issue where you have children born being stateless in the United States. However, you do have a number of people who have come into the country, um, migrated into the country um, from various um, other areas of the world, and who have who find themselves stateless here in the United States. Because there is no definition of a stateless person under U.S. law, there is no um, there is no specific pathway to resolving a situation of statelessness. Meaning, there's no pathway to citizenship for stateless people um, here in the United States. And that oftentimes, because of that, um, folks are actually left without um, certain protections and are, are now often in um, long-term situations of statelessness living here in the U.S., some of them with removal orders. And we'll discuss a little bit more some of the hardships that folks face, but I wanted to just take a break here from my talking to let you hear a little bit um, from uh, one of our, one of um, a, from a stateless person himself and one of the ways in which he um, experienced statelessness and actually fell through the cracks in immigration law um, and the hardships that he faced. Okay, actually, we're getting some feedback that actually we're not able to hear the, the video. So what we'll go ahead and do is we'll stop the video here. Um, we'll send out a link to it. It is on our website. Um, and you can go at a later time and listen to, um, to Mikhail's story um, and see how, um, sit, how his situation of statelessness actually developed for him. So I definitely encourage you to do it. Um, to, to start understanding again the, the actual impact of statelessness on people living in the United States. So um, another way to explore this, um, this issue of the impact of, of, um, of uh, statelessness on, on individuals living in the United States is, in, is a 2012 report um, that we put out called Citizens of Nowhere together with the Open Society Justice Initiative where we really um, raised the issue of statelessness and statelessness in the United States, talked about some of the ways in which it arises and goes unaddressed. Um, and really dig into the hardships that um, that stateless people face here in the United States because um, because they're stateless. Those fall into a range of different categories, but again, because these are folks who have um, are typically have migrated to the United States and are living here um, without a nationality. Um, Many of them have gone through um, immigration removal proceedings or living here on orders of supervision, or they might be placed into removal proceedings. Some of them might be here undocumented, but all of the, the hardships that they face are often, um, are often the same. That includes 
no or limited work authorization um, in perpetuity, uh, restrictions on their travel, not just um, restrictions on their travel within the United States, but an inability to leave the United States because they actually have no, um, they have no, they actually have no, um, sorry, okay, let's see the slides. Uh -oh. It looks like the slides have disappeared um, from the screen as well. With apologies for some of the technical aspect. Um, let's see, okay, there you okay, here we are. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Okay, so as I was saying, restrictions on travel, uh, that is actually something because there is the, I mean, an individual has no passport, um, there's no country that recognizes that person as a citizen, there's no passport and they're unable to travel outside of the United States. Um, there are threats of detention and potential redetention in immigration detention during, um, during removal proceedings or after. There is a lack of access to benefits. There's the potential of being placed on uh, ankle monitors and, um, and orders of supervision that could potentially be a bit onerous um, in someone's life as they're trying to live their lives here in the United States um, on, um, on an order of supervision. They also may be required to report into immigration authorities. And actually, if you go back and watch um, watch Mikhail's uh, video, this actually comes up in his video in his story where he had to report in occasionally to, um, to immigration authorities to let them know where he was and to show that he was actually trying to facilitate his removal to another country um, where no country in the world recognized him as a citizen. So you can imagine that, that frustration. Um, and then finally, too, perhaps one of the biggest challenges and hardships that we consistently hear from stateless people who we work with is the is the the fundamental lack of, of family unity um, and inability to go and see their loved ones, their parents, their children um, who might be outside of the United States. And again, going back to this idea of they don't have a passport, they don't have a means to travel, they oftentimes um, stateless people find themselves stuck in the United States, separated from their parents and children who might be going through their own hardships wherever they are and unable to reunite with them. Um, an important piece of all of this is that, um, is that you know, people are in a situation of statelessness, typically through no fault of their own, um, and due to those factors that I discussed earlier, and resolving at their inability to resolve it is really or the ability to resolve it, unfortunately, greatly lies with, with countries and states being able to provide a pathway to doing that. Um, so one, uh, one quick thing I wanted to highlight, um, and then this is of particular relevance to, again, to those folks on the phone who are attorneys. We, you and you shared, although there is, there, there is no definition of a stateless person under US law, and there is no pathway to citizenship specifically based on statelessness. That doesn't mean that um, a client who has statelessness or who is who, a client who is stateless does not have um, that, that that condition isn't relevant to um, potential areas of their immigration claim. Um, l just last year, we launched the first edition of a manual representing stateless persons before U.S. immigration authorities where we cover a range of different topics in which um, statelessness itself is, um, is important to consider in, um, in a potential stateless client's case. Um, and it's basically divided into three chapters. The first is understanding, identifying, and proving statelessness. This really digs into going back to that, um, that manual um, of UNHCR is kind of how to identify a stateless client when they come into your office. Um, and how to prove statelessness in, in, a, in a specific case before immigration authorities. So having those legal arguments and that evidentiary basis for showing that finding of statelessness is really critical. Then chapter two um, explores various avenues for relief um, for stateless people. Um, so this goes into everything from um, asylum, um, and we actually I should make a plug, we have uh, back in August of last year, we actually had a first in the series of webinars where we discussed um, statelessness and, and its relevance in you under U.S. asylum law and proving statelessness in asylum claims um, is actually really um, it's explored in the in the manual. Spoiler alert: Our colleagues who are going to be joining um, the webinar to discuss the motions to reopen are also going to be touching on asylum, so that's a really important thing. So there are a few different avenues for relief that that are covered within Chapter Two, and then. Um, 
uh, alleviating other hardships um, that uh, stateless people cover. So um, how to, um, for instance, uh, request a lessening of order of supervision requirements um, or other pieces, how to request um, release from detention, pieces like that, and ways in which statelessness itself can become very relevant in a client's case. So we highly recommend um, you're taking a look at this and understanding all of these different ways and exploring this manual. It is um, the first edition and we're looking forward to um, a second edition that's built off of your, uh, your experience and practice. Okay, so based on that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up my portion. We're gonna, and I'll turn um, the mic back over to Michaela. We're gonna hold off, I think, on questions until the end after our colleagues, Jody and Brett, make their presentation. Yes, thanks so much, Lindsay. Yeah, again, if anyone has any questions, we haven't gotten any so far, but feel free to ask them on the right of your screen and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next speakers. First, we have Jody Zeisimer. She's a supervising attorney at Catholic Charities Archdiocese of New York for the Immigrant Children Advocacy and Relief Effort and Unaccompanied Minors Program. Jody coordinates representation of recently arrived unaccompanied immigrant children and oversees a team of attorneys who provide services to immigrant youth detained with the Office of Refugee Resettlement. In addition, she's worked for the past eight years representing a wide variety of immigrants in front of EOIR and USCIS. During her 13 years in immigration law, Jody's worked on a range of projects, including human trafficking, naturalization drives, pro bono asylum, representation for unaccompanied minors, and victims of violent crime. She recently co-authored an article for the Georgetown Immigration Law Journal entitled The Right to Have, Le the right to have Rights, Loss of Citizenship, Asylum, and Constitutional Principles. So we're excited to have you here, Jody. And then along with Jody, we have Brett Stark, who is a legal director and co-founder of Terra Firma at Catholic Charities New York. He represents unaccompanied immigrant children in federal and state litigation, specializing in asylum and special, special immigrant juvenile cases. A formal Equal Justice Works Fellow, Brett has worked in a refugee resettlement in Kenya on human rights in Israel and was a 2008 Fulbright Scholar in Taiwan. Brett is the co-author of Terra Firma Medical Legal Care for Unaccompanied Immigrant Garifuana Children, Harvard Journal of African American Public Policy, and The Right to Have Rights, Loss of Citizenship, Asylum, and Constitutional Principles. Brett is a graduate of Harvard Law School and the University of Rochester, and he's admitted to the New York Bar in the Eastern and Southern Districts of New York. And I am going to hand this over to you guys, Jody and Brett. Um, let's make sure this works. Um, okay, so thank you very much for that introduction. Hopefully everyone can see our slides. Um, and hear us. And hear us. <laughs> uh, so yeah. as, um, as Michaela said, we're going to be talking specifically about um, motions to reopen in the context of statelessness and focusing particularly on asylum. So we're going to be going through um, the law on motions to reopen, sort of the legal standard, which is change in circumstances, how statelessness fits into that as a material change, and then sort of three rules that uh, we have pulled from the cases that we've done um, and sort of a framework to consider how to present these cases. And then we'll segue into talking about statelessness um, and asylum and how those intersect, um, how particularly that's relevant for a motion to reopen um, and go into some of the theories on presenting statelessness claims for asylum. So we wanted to talk as a way of introduction about the case that we worked on that gave us sort of an introduction to this issue. Um, so we met the Jorbina family um, in 2009. They had, uh, they, the parents, Boris and Tatiana, originally from Russia, had immigrated um, to what is now Kazakhstan in the Soviet, when the Soviet Union was still a um, United State, and their children were born there. They came, the whole family came to the United States in 1997, 1998, um, right after the fall of the Soviet Union and the creation of the country of Kazakhstan. Um, and they were fleeing um, persecution in Kazakhstan because of their ethnicity. They applied for asylum in 1999 and were denied um, by a judge who had a very high denial rate. 
So they received an order of removal. It wasn't until a decade later that ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, tried to execute that order. Um, and through doing that, applied to the, the consulate of Kazakhstan for permission for passports or permission for them to travel back to Kazakhstan. And the consulate issued a letter revoking citizenship for the whole family. On its face, and in the letter that revoked citizenship, it said that this was a technical matter, an administrative statute that the family had violated by not registering at the uh, Kazakh consulate when they arrived in the United States. Um, but as we'll discuss, we believed that this was part of a larger sort of scheme or practice in the country of Kazakhstan to manipulate their citizenship laws to favor certain ethnicities and disfavor other ethnicities. So that's the, the claim that sort of brought us into this issue. And because they had a removal order, we were presented with doing a motion to reopen um, so that the court can consider this change in their circumstances um, and to present this new, their new status as stateless people as a basis for an asylum claim. So generally, um, there are sort of two procedural postures for motions to reopen. One is when um, an immigrant or a family has received a final order of removal um, in absentia, meaning that they have failed to appear at a hearing and have been ordered removed um, because of their failure to appear. We're not going to be discussing sort of that procedural posture. There's a whole set of uh, statutory uh, statutes and regulations that sort of govern that, um, but the standard for reopening those cases is a lack of notice. What we're going to be focusing on is people who have received a final order of removal after they have presented an application for relief or after they have gone through the merits of a proceeding and have been denied relief. Um, and so we're talking about how to, sub to open one of these substantive denials. Um, and just to note that this is, um, there's also motions to reconsider, which is sort of distinct. Um, motions to reconsider are, are filed when there's been an error of law or fact. Um, those have to be filed within 30 days of a final order. Again, we're not going to be really focusing on that. We're focusing on motions to reopen. So the statute on motions to reopen has uh, both a time and numeric limit. So motions to reopen um, usually have to be filed within 90 days of the final order, and only one motion can be filed. We're going to talk about the exception to this rule, um, but I do want to mention um, two other exceptions before we go into the large one, which will be the focus of this presentation. Um, there's two ways you can get a motion to reopen considered and adjudicated um, outside of this 90-day limit or after one motion has been filed and denied. One of those ways is to request ICE join you or the respondent in the motion to reopen. Um, so there is a regulatory provision saying that if ICE um, is in agreement and joins in the motion that the judge shall reopen the case for a rehearing. Um, historically, or in the last um, few years, ICE has been fairly um, generous in their joining of motions to reopen. That has changed quite considerably in this new administration. Um, the regulation is still on the books. I think in theory, you could ask ICE to join you on a motion. Although in practice, I think that they are very unlikely to do so. The second way that you can have a motion considered um, is to ask the judge or the Board of Immigration Appeals to consider reopening the case sua sponte, uh, which is just on their own discretion. Um, this is usually done if you have less of a legal basis um, so we're going to talk about sort of how to frame the legal basis, what are the standards. If you have a case that has sympathetic factors but does not rise to the level of meeting some of the legal standards, you can always petition for the judge to reopen the case sua sponte. Um, and this can be 
either because there is hasn't been a change in circumstances or because the um, the respondent wants to pursue a type of relief other than asylum or other than um, sort of humanitarian based. For example, if they have like a, if they're eligible for a family based adjustment of status or other sort of other protections besides asylum, you might consider asking the court to reopen the case to respond to. Okay, just a small note on jurisdiction. You filed a motion to reopen in the last um, court that heard the case. So if it was an immigration judge that made the final ruling and the case was not appealed to the Board of Immigration Appeals, jurisdiction still lies with the immigration judge and that is who you will file the motion to reopen with. Um, if there was a decision appealed to the Board of Immigration Appeals, the BIA, and that is the body that made the final decision, then that is where you will file the motion to reopen. Okay, as I alluded to, the standard for uh, filing a motion to reopen beyond that 90-day time limit must be premised on a change in circumstances. And we're gonna talk about the details of what that legal standard is and how you meet this exception. Um, so what is a change in circumstance? Very broadly, it is new facts that are articulatable and that are material to the eligibility for underlying relief. Um, and that must be accompanied by evidence. So you prove these facts by some sort of evidence, um, whether that be specific evidence um, pertaining to the respondent, to the immigrant themselves, or general country conditions showing, showing that there's been a change in the circumstances in the home country. Um, so there's three basic standards that go into, or considerations that go into what is a change circumstance. One is that it must be material. The second is that it was not available at the time of the adjudication of the, of the case and that it could not have been discovered or presented at the previous proceedings, meaning that it was not available and further inquiry or more diligent um, discovery process or investigation would not have produced this evidence. What Change circumstances are not, according to the courts, are anything that is self-induced and personal to the respondent. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this distinction of personal versus general um, country conditions and, this, um, and how to distinguish between those and how the court distinguishes them. But the courts agree that anything that is self-induced, meaning that the respondent has created a circumstance for themselves um, that would possibly give rise to a new claim is not considered a change in circumstance. Um, so the underlying case um, that is cited here talks about a family who after, a family from China who after an order of removal went on to have additional children and then tried to claim that they are now in violation of the one child policy in China such that they have a claim for asylum abuse it would be persecuted because of having a larger family. Um, the courts uh, decided that the family had created that circumstance for themselves and therefore it was not an objective change in, in circumstances that could be considered for a motion to reopen. Um, another context in which this arises um, and is uh, something to distinguish is when a person converts from one religion to another religion or adopts a religion that they previously had not been practicing. That, although that is a personal choice of the immigrant, as long as the conversion is sincere, is not considered um, self-induced. However, it must also come with a change in country conditions as well. So the country itself has also cracked down on this religion or has been exhibited more persecutory type action, either change in the law or change in how the law is enforced, that would, in combination with the convert, the personal conversion, give rise to a change in country conditions to form a basis 
for a motion to reopen and for new eligibility for relief. There is a, a split in the circuit about what can be considered um, in personal circumstances and in general conditions in the country. So as you can see, the second and third circuit, which is um, New York and New Jersey and some of the Eastern Seaboard, um, does not consider personal circumstances um, and will only consider changes in the, in the country of origin when evaluating whether there's been a change in circumstances. Many of the other circuits will consider both in combination. So we'll consider an objective change in the country, either laws that have been passed or new practices or a heightened enforcement of certain laws and a change in sort of personal circumstances of the immigrant or the immigrant's family inside the United States. And we'll consider those in conjunction when evaluating whether there's been a change in circumstance. Um, so the question that is being asked, that is being considered um, by the court in the motion to reopen is whether there has been a change in, in personal circumstances um, since the issuance of the initial order of removal and, whether, and what can be considered. So just in sum, if there's a change in country conditions that would merit a grant of asylum now, that the person or the family will now be persecuted because of, like I said, changes in how the country has enacted the laws or a change in the government of the country, that is a grant of a motion to reopen. If it's a change only in the circumstances of the immigrant themselves or their family without a change in the conditions of the country of origin, that is not enough in any circuit to grant a motion to reopen. If there's been a combination of the two, a change, both an objective change in, in the country conditions and a change in personal circumstances that in conjunction with each other would create a new a claim for asylum, then it depends on the circuit in which the uh, respondent resides, whether or not that will form a basis for a motion to reopen. Um, so in general, um, motions to reopen are considered to be a heavy lift, a heavy burden on the respondent, um, because it, you're asking the court to upset a previous decision that they have made on the merits of the claim. So this is a high bar um, and the courts have broad discretion. There's often a case that is cited from 1992, this INS versus Doherty, which the, the quotation is that motions for reopening of immigration proceedings are disfavored. There has been a change in the statutory law since then, and the, the most recent case law from the Supreme Court is actually Kukana versus Holder, um, which has a little more generous reading of the motion to reopen laws. So in 1996, uh, there was a law that was passed that actually codified in the statute the right to a motion to reopen based on change of circumstances. Um, and as the Supreme Court stated in Kukana, uh, the motion to reopen is an important safeguard uh, for the protection of immigrants. So uh, we encourage people to look to the most recent case law and to cite that um, when you're asking the court to exercise discretion favorably and to consider um, the changes under this new statutory framework. Um, that said, it still is a heavy burden and you're asking the court to really overturn a previous decision, which they do not do lightly. Okay, thank you, Jody. So uh, I'm gonna take over from here, this is Brett. And so uh, Jody uh, has very nicely laid out the framework and the background for how motion to reopens are uh, generally adjudicated and the context in which they're decided and the most relevant considerations. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit um, on that question to look particularly at the intersection of motions to reopen and statelessness. Uh, and the question becomes, is statelessness a change in country conditions sufficient for granting a motion to reopen? Uh, and there's three primary questions uh, for that analysis. One, uh, which applies to all motions to reopen. One is statelessness material. Was it not available and could have been discovered or presented at the previous proceeding? 
so we want the answer to the first question to be yes, statelessness is material. So uh, some of the questions come back to uh, the Jorbina case that Jody mentioned at the beginning of our presentation that I think that I'll be referencing and sprinkling throughout. But essentially it asks, uh, you know, is it material not only as a change of personal circumstances and country conditions, but also to an asylum claim? How is it relevant to an asylum claim? And so we might ask here, who effectuated the loss of citizenship? Lindsay talked in the beginning about different examples in which people can become stateless. So for example, if someone lived in the former Yugoslavia and lost their, their citizenship uh, incident to a change in national boundaries, is that uh, material to an asylum claim? That might be a harder case. On the other hand, uh, we also discussed in the first part of the presentation uh, the situation in the Dominican Republic in which uh, people there specifically of Haitian origin had lost their citizenship. That might be very much material to an asylum uh, application and statelessness in that case and the loss of citizenship there uh, might very much be a material change that affects eligibility for asylum. So we're looking at questions like what was the motivation or uh, the, the reason for the loss of citizenship and how it occurred and is there a nexus between that motivation and a protected ground, race, nationality, religion, political opini opinion or membership in a particular social group. So it's kind of interfacing the typical asylum uh, analysis and the typical asylum case um, with the question of materiality for motions to reopen looking specifically at statelessness. Um, one note about that, uh, which I think is an interesting sort of more theoretical aspect of this question, which is in the normal asylum case, there's no question that harm occurred, um, that uh, persecution occurred. Someone might have been tortured or detained or arrested or threatened. And the question in most asylum cases is, is there a link between that harm and uh, the government? Can government action be implicated in some way? And I think one thing that we discovered in working with the Jorbinas and our experience with these issues in these cases is that the dynamic is actually the reverse. In these cases, it's easy to find government action. After all, it's usually a government that is responsible for someone's loss of citizenship. However, uh, the more interesting question that's still being uh, litigated and adjudicated and I think remains unresolved is whether loss of citizenship, whether becoming statelessness, can itself be classified as a harm. And we're going to go uh, a little bit later in this presentation looking exactly at uh, some sources outside of immigration law that can help us answer that question and maybe articulate for a court why statelessness is a harm resulting uh, in equaling persecution. Uh, finally, the third prong of this section is, was evidence of statelessness not available? So what you're going to be looking at was, state, did the statelessness, did the loss of citizenship occur pre or post removal order uh, and regardless of whether it so if it occurred post removal order there's a very good and clear case to say no it was not available at the previous hearing like the Jorbinas they didn't lose their citizenship until 10 years later so that's a very clear case in which uh, that evidence was not available when the original asylum decision was entered on the other hand is there new evidence of a pattern and practice of mistreatment of stateless people that only became available post removal order are there new country conditions about how stateless people are treated in their country of origin, looking to UNHCR and other resources that might help us answer the question, what is a stateless person likely to face? What are they likely to return to uh, should they come back? And there might be very material changes in how stateless people are treated uh, in the country of origin uh, that wasn't available um, at the previous hearing. I think specifically in the country of Kazakhstan, which again, bringing in the Jorbinas as a theme and model and template for this discussion, when they came to the United States and first applied for asylum, the country of Kazakhstan was hardly even a country. It existed for a year and change. And so looking at how the situation in that country has evolved over time uh, would really be uh, material, to use that same word again, to the question of whether that evidence was available. It wasn't available at the time because the situation in that country was still developing. Uh, and finally, no, it could not have been, been presented at the previous proceeding. So that overlaps with the same reasons. If it was post-removal order, it obviously couldn't have been uh, presented at the previous uh, proceeding. And like the Jorbina case, we're talking about an act of denationalization that occurred 10 years after the original asylum hearing. So it's very important to pay attention to when statelessness occurred in the posture of the case vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, the asylum decision denial. 
So when you're presenting one of these uh, motions to reopen, uh, Jody and I, in looking at these uh, cases, and in the Drobina case in particular, kind of distilled three reasons or three arguments that, uh, to make about why evidence of statelessness um, is important for, uh, your, uh, for your motion to reopen. Uh, the relevant evidence rule, the principal argument rule, and the pretext rule. And we're going to talk about how each of these showed up um, in our case in the Jorbina matter. So the first is the relevant evidence rule. Uh, and under that rule, uh, the BIA is obligated to consider all relevant evidence on record. Uh, this is a, you know, kind of a basic tenet of administrative law uh, that all relevant evidence has to be considered in rendering a decision. But I think what's really interesting about this area, area and this topic is that loss of citizenship uh, sometimes, maybe even many times, is not considered um, in the original asylum claim. Many times people who are stateless, stateless and applying for asylum may not be bringing in their stateless status as part of the reason that they fear persecution in their home country. Um, but it absolutely is relevant for reasons that we'll get into in a little bit. And so treatment of stateless persons is relevant not only to past persecution, uh, how they became stateless, why they became stateless, and where they made stateless, on the basis of a protected ground, but also treatment of stateless persons in the future. What are the country conditions like now? Uh, second, we have the principal argument rule. The BIA, um, or whichever body, if it's to the IJ, the same rule would apply. Uh, there's an obligation to consider the petitioner's principal argument. Uh, in the Drobina case, there was this idea of a manipulation of citizenship laws and evidence of pretext that Jody already mentioned before. So, uh, for instance, if someone uh, when the Drobinas came to the United States, they were supposedly required uh, to register with the Kazakh consulate uh, upon arriving here. They didn't. They lost their citizenship as a result. But what could appear to be a facially neutral law was actually what our re research uh, uncovered was actually an attempt to create a new demography in Kazakhstan, which increased the number of ethnic Kazakhs and decreased the number of ethnic Russians. Uh, and so we said that their revocation of citizenship was pretextual. And that was our principal argument. So uh, the BIA in the Jorbina case gave a very summary dismissal of uh, our motion to reopen. And I think if I was sort of to imagine what the adjudicators were thinking and read in between the lines a little bit, they were thinking about cases like Yugoslavia uh, and elsewhere where law of citizenship may not be directly tied to persecution. But here we made the case that no, our principal argument is this pretextual revocation of citizenship that's different in incidental change in national borders and boundaries. Uh, and so the BIA had what they thought might be a really simple and straightforward case. No statelessness does not equal persecution. Uh, but we were looking at it from a different angle and are encouraging everyone and all of you to look at it from a different angle, too, to look a little bit behind the reasons uh, and methods that statelessness occurred and if they're uh, related or give rise to an asylum claim. Um, I just talked about this a little bit in the last slide, so I'm not going to go too much over it again here, but the pretext rule. Uh, the BIA is obligated to consider evidence of pretext even if it's not the principal argument. So even if we had had a different theory about how our clients were rendered stateless that had nothing to do with a pretextual revocation of their citizenship, uh, the BIA is obligated to consider credible and specific evidence that a government action is pretextual uh, no matter what, whether that's our number one argument or number five. So just going back a little bit to the posture of the case, on um, in 2011, uh, the BIA denied the Jorbina's uh, motion to reopen, as I discussed, in a very summary, sort of conclusory kind of decision. Uh, but in 2013, the Second Circuit vacated the BIA's decision and reopened the removal proceeding. Um, so part of the motion to reopen so we discussed the legal standard for the motion to reopen, but related to that and sort of also as a separate matter is that you have to pr prove prima facie eligibility for some sort of relief. So it's not enough to say that there's been a change in country conditions. You also have to prove that you have a viable claim that can be heard by, um, by the immigration judge. So for, the, for most of these cases, that's going to be a claim for asylum. Um, so you have to present, and again, these are overlapping issues because many of the um, issues that are going to go into a prima facie case for asylum um, are also going to overlap with the materiality of the change in country conditions um, and the evidence presented. So just a review, you can prove, 
prove a prima facie case for asylum by either showing that there's been past persecution um, by the government in the country of origin or a well-founded fear of future persecution. Um, so in particular, um, to statelessness and the revocation of citizenship, and in the Jorbina case, we argue both of these things. We argued that the revocation of citizenship by itself is a persecutory act by the government. And we argued that there's a well-founded fear of future persecution because now the family is stateless. And the treatment of stateless people in Kazakhstan is such that they would be persecuted. So you can argue both of these things. Mostly you're going to be focusing, I think, on the future persecution. But don't lose sight of the argument that the revocation of citizenship or the rendering of a person as stateless can be an act of persecution. Um, and there's ample support for that theory in US constitutional law. Um, so we uncovered or discovered <laughs> a whole series of cases decided by our Supreme Court when considering this issue um, in our own laws. So Trump versus Dulles is probably the, the primary case on this issue. And the conclusion of that case was um, that revocation, there was a law revoke that allowed the U.S. to revoke citizenship for um, people who had deserted um, the military in a time of war. And the Supreme Court concluded that that law was in violation of the Eighth Amendment um, prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. And a lot of the language and discussion around revocation of citizenship by a government um, is really pertinent to this um, the consideration of this issue. So the, the court said that revocation of citizenship is a form of punishment more primitive than torture because citizenship is the right to have rights. It is what from what other rights flow and that taking away somebody's citizenship is a condition deplored in the international community um, and as lindsay discussed there are international treaties and conventions that really underpin this this theory that revocation of citizenship is um, is deplored in the international community is codified in a lot of these conventions um, and there's also a lot of specific country reports that talk about the condition of stateless people and how that overlaps with the persecution that the government often revokes citizenship in order to continue or to further persecution of a certain disfavored population. Um, so, uh to continue on that, that theme, taking some of these constitutional cases and applying them to our uh, statelessness cases and motions to reopen, uh, you know, loss of citizenship and statelessness subjects the individual to a fate of ever increasing fear and distress. The stateless person's very existence is at the sufferance of the country in which he happens to find himself. So we kind of see these cases as, you know, sort of perhaps, I mean, surely unwittingly, but uh, talking about both past persecution and future persecution. Uh, so here, and as Jody mentioned in the last slide, there's the idea that loss of citizenship is itself a persecutory act and is itself past persecution. And in some of the case law out of the Seventh Circuit and the Sixth Circuit, they talk about statelessness as being a harbinger of other harms. Uh, and they reference things like the Nuremberg Laws in Nazi Germany, where uh, losing citizenship, where stripping people of their citizenship rights uh, was only the first step in uh, an, a persecutory regime that very clearly for the Seventh Circuit indicated uh, that uh, asylum was merited and persecution was taking place. But at the same time, this idea that loss of citizenship is loss of the right to have rights, it's, a, it's the wellspring, as Jody said, of all civil rights. And so losing those important rights are important for the past persecution consideration, but even should someone return to a country in which they technically can return to, uh, but as a stateless person, the idea of not being able to access any of the basic services or uh, being able to even really uh, appear and present in court uh, as um, a citizen in that country is part of the forward-looking uh, future persecution consideration. And this, I think, was also some of the 
fundamental theories of human rights law was the ability of a person to participate in civil society, to have a voice in their government, to have access to government services, and the protection of a state. And so I, I think we've gotten away from that as a theory of persecution, but that was certainly considered by our courts and our, um, in our country and by some of the, the founding conventions in the international law that the access to civil rights and participation in civil society is one of the fundamental um, human rights. And so loss of that right is in and of itself persecution, even if there's not physical harm flowing from that. And so what we want to look at um, is uh, how our own courts have interpreted international law. And it says here um, that the power to take away a citizen's citizenship cannot be sustained as an implied attribute of sovereignty possessed by all nations. Uh, so this is a statement from uh, the Supreme Court. And, uh, ref and what's important to notice about that is that even, a, even some of the subsequent decisions in the Seventh Circuit and the Sixth Circuit talk about um, states having the ability to choose who are and aren't their citizens which may be true in terms of naturalization laws, but are not true in terms of uh, rendering people stateless and stripping them of their citizenship status. So you still see, even though we have uh, from our own constitutional laws, very clear uh, statements about the inability of countries to take away uh, the citizenship of their citizens, we still have this idea persisting in immigration law uh, that somehow that isn't by itself a harm. And what we're suggesting is looking at constitutional law to show and prove that it is. Um, so, from our understanding, the way that um, in looking at motions to reopen based on statelessness and looking at uh, stateless asylum cases in general when making out the prima facie case, uh, there's an important difference, and that's between uh, denationalization and denaturalization. So, denationalization occurs when a government strips a citizen of their citizenship, and the Supreme Court has a well-developed well body of case law that goes back to 1898 addressing this issue and concludes basically, uh, as Jody mentioned, that to do so is a violation of the Constitution's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. So uh, that's not okay. Uh, what is okay is denaturalization, which is the revocation of naturalized status. That's someone who immigrates to a country, uh, becomes a citizen, and then for a number of reasons, uh, loses their citizenship that they have acquired uh, through, um, through that process. Uh, that is okay, and we as a country, of course, do that all the time in cases uh, of fraud or um, undisclosed information or criminal activity uh, that renders someone no longer eligible to possess the status that they have at that moment, uh, lawful permanent residency. For uh, so differentiating between denationalization and denaturalization is really important. So did someone become stateless? Uh, in almost all cases, it's going to be because they were denationalized as opposed to denaturalized. Uh, and so looking again to these cases, uh, we see that the Supreme Court really has spoken clearly about this. There's a strong presumption against revocation of citizenship as lawful punishment. Looking again to the Jorbinas, uh, that the government of Kazakhstan uh, did not have a right under our interpretation of uh, our fundamental rights to uh, strip them of their citizenship. Uh, and for U.S. citizens, it's similarly true that uh, the government can't take away their citizenship. It can only be voluntarily renounced. Um, and that reasons for denationalizing citizens are inherently suspect and the harms inherently egregious. Uh, and so basically it's the will of the citizen that determines whether or not they give up their citizenship and not the will of the government. And so transposing that principle and idea into immigration law, into asylum law, uh, we see that someone who lost their citizenship status against their consent or against their will uh, really should be equivalent to uh, the ways in which we uh, declare those things to be unsustainable and unacceptable uh, under our own constitutional principles. So just to kind of uh, tie it all together with a closing thought, um, that citizenship is so fundamental to identity and to a person's sense of self that its loss uh, affects the deprivation of all that, make, all that makes life worth living. Uh, that's an extremely powerful, uh, perhaps dramatic statement about the importance of citizenship rights. Uh, but I think it's an appropriate and an effective one uh, because when we're looking at a statelessness, when we're looking at someone who's a citizen of nowhere, uh, 
uh, as was said, uh, we see that their options are quite few and their reasons for wanting to seek protection in the United States are perhaps more urgent uh, than anyone than, than many others uh, because what they're left with is uh, only one avenue for obtaining uh, citizenship or obtaining any kind of status and that's in the country where they currently find themselves. They cannot travel to other countries as was discussed as was mentioned uh, previously so that uh, finding a way to uh, through a motion to reopen or through an asylum case uh, to um, to regain that fundamental identity uh, has been given primary importance with the Supreme Court and should also be given primary importance in our litigation of these issues in immigration law. Uh, so here are just a few uh, references that informed uh, some of the information that we presented today. Um, overviews about motions to reopen, uh, change circumstances, uh, and then uh, finally more of sort of a theoretical constitutional look uh, at how this all ties together. Hey, thank you, know, you so much. Oh, yeah. go ahead. No, I was just going to say we have about 15 minutes for questions, and we'd be glad to to answer questions or discuss any of these topics or issues. Yep. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was awesome. Um, I think Lindsay has a couple of comments, and then we'll go into some questions. Yeah, and I just wanted to yeah thank you both so much. I just wanted to point out um, to those who are going to be referencing the statelessness manual that um, motions to reopen are discussed at the end of section um, of part two of the, of the manual. And we discuss all, you know, very similar grounds that, um, that have been discussed by Jody um, and Brett just now. And I would also point out that um, if you're interested in seeing it, the, um, the opening brief of um, the Jorbina case, where a lot of the, the arguments related to statelessness um, were laid out by the Catholic Charities team. That's actually included as an appendix to the um, as an appendix to the the statelessness manual. So you can actually see how some of these arguments played out in an actual legal briefing. Um, so just wanted to point that out. Okay, so we have just one question at the moment, but everyone else who's still here, feel free to ask a question. Um, this is from one of our stateless persons who is tuning in. Um, she says, hi, I was born in Kuwait, but I'm stateless. Kuwait's law is that if you have to follow your father's citizenship, her mother is, Kuwait, is a Kuwaiti citizen and her father is considered stateless. She's wondering if she could argue the discrimination against women that their child can't follow their citizenship, if she could use that discrimination. Um, and she is noting also that there's a lot of mistreatment towards the Badoon or stateless people in Kuwait. So I don't know if anyone has some reflections on that. Yeah, Did thank you, you for that question. I, I, mean, I think this presents a lot of the issues that we discussed as how to formulate um, a claim for asylum. And obviously we would encourage her to get a specific legal consultation. Um, to see, I'm not sure if she's in the United States, but to see if she fits into that and to discuss the posture of the case. Um, but, but yes, I think that what we were discussing is um, that this raises issues of both future persecution based on the fact that not only is she stateless and perhaps the treatment that she has received in Kuwait or that her family has received in Kuwait, but that also her daughter would face persecution um, by not having sort of access to the civil society or to the rights afforded to citizens um, in Kuwait. And that may be a reason in and of itself that the courts could find that she could be persecuted or has a fear of future persecution. And, and this fact that the fact of statelessness can certainly be seen as an indicia of other types of harm and discrimination. So if they want to make a case more broadly uh, about treatment, um, the, the lack of citizenship itself would be the first thing to present, but can also be connected to other types of persecution that, that then confirms, affirms, and supports. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to all of that, I mean, just to kind of take it back to the international human rights framework, I mean, if we're going to be looking at the right to nationality and the right to be free from discrimination um, in terms of acquisition of nationality, 
You can really look at um, the ICCPR um, and the CERD and even CEDAW, um, those provisions that I mentioned at the beginning um, that, that actually um, create a prohibition on discrimination on the basis of a range of different grounds, be they ethnic, racial, or gender-based grounds, um, that you cannot be denied um, citizenship based on those grounds. So um, would uh, would also just point back to that for an analysis of potentially rights that have been violated or future rights that will be violated. Okay, so we don't have any more questions right now. Um, of course, everyone who's still tuning in, feel free to reach out to us for questions. Actually, we have one that just popped up. Um, okay, this one says, I have an Iraqi client who has been ordered deported because of his criminal activity. We're filing for cat relief. He left Iraq as a refugee 40 years ago, and the documentation lists him as stateless. How does statelessness affect the ability of the U.S. to deport to Iraq? Will Iraq accept this person? That's a good question. And we didn't really discuss sort of the practical aspect of this. Um, but when a person is stateless, it does cause a lot of complications for ICE, the enforcement arm of immigration, to actually execute a removal order. Um, they are trying to resolve those issues. And so um, they will try to get the Iraqi government to accept him um, and sort of on a, like a personal agreement that they can um, that he can be returned there even though he lacks citizenship um, if that fails they will try to deport him to another country that may accept him um, but it also may result that he even though he is legally able to be deported practically he cannot be um, but that doesn't really affect the legal claim that you're going to be making under the convention against torture um, which is I think that you will be presenting evidence both of his uh, the treatment of somebody who is stateless in Iraq, as well as perhaps some other um, factors such as ethnicity or um, religion or other things like that um, that intersect with his statelessness. And as part of making that case, I think Jody's exactly right, and I, I think what would be helpful to have is sort of a list or a country conditions expert or some research about what a stateless person won't be able to do, can or can't be able to do uh, in Iraq, sort of what hardships are they likely to encounter, uh, what barriers, what kinds of discrimination. Um, so sort of digging deep into those things and figuring out uh, what exactly life is like for stateless persons in Iraq today. Thanks so much for that question. Um, we have another one. This one says, with the termination of the TPS for Haiti, what's going to happen with all the people that are stateless here in the U.S. and have to go back to Haiti? So um, that's a good question <laughs> that I'm trying to figure out. I mean, there's, that question has a very complicated and broad answer. Um, you know, in immigration law, every case is adjudicated individually, and there will be a lot of questions about the, both the nationality um, of the person before they, uh, or right now, before they saw TPS, after they saw TPS, and then also the procedural posture of their case. So many people who were eligible for TPS um, were eligible at many different stages in the immigration journey. So they could have been recently arrived in the United States. Um, in 2010 or 11, or they could have had at that point already gone through an asylum process and have an um, order of removal. Um, so many of those people may want to look at our slides on motions to reopen to see if that's an option. Um, and then also look, have, has that person lost their citizenship um, from Haiti? I, don't believe that Haiti has revoked people's citizenship. Um, so that might not be pertinent to a lot of those cases, but certainly if that issue arises, um, a lot of what we discussed today will be relevant. And I would just chime in just to kind of follow up on Jody's point on this. Um, you know, it, just remember 
that um, if you're going to raise statelessness in your in your client's case, it's really good to go through and really think through the arguments as to why you think your your client is stateless, and to really look at all of those evidentiary pieces that exist to to satisfy the definition. Um, there are a number of people, again, I would just flag that there are people who are in a situation that's very similar to statelessness, but they actually are citizens of, of the country from, uh, you know, in which they were born or otherwise. Um, and so it's really important um, as attorneys to, to look very closely at the case. Um, and and make sure that you are are, are certain that um, that your your the individual is stateless um, and that that will then kind of play out and how you can make arguments with the, with the government. Okay, thank you for that question. We have one more that's a follow-up question um, from the attorney with the Iraqi client. She is wondering if UNHCR can help with an expert. <laughs> Um, we UNHCR is here as a resource um, to um, to attorneys and to stateless people and to other experts. Um, you know, if you have specific questions about incidences of statelessness in a certain country, you know, please feel free to to reach out, and we will um, try to get an answer back to you, or at least point you in the direction of where um, country conditions uh, information may exist. We do have a very extensive online uh, library of, um, of resources at www.refworld, that's R-E-F as in Frank, world.org. Um, and you can go on there and find um, a range of different information organized by country, um, organized by topic. There's a lot about statelessness, um, but there are also some really great country uh, conditions reports that, that are up online and that can be very useful um, in um, providing evidence or helping you direct your, your arguments and, and support your arguments in individual cases. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Um, but again, feel free to reach out to us if you can think of any in the future. We will circulate a recording of this presentation um, and we will also send out all of the resources that we've talked about today. Um, an extra thank you to Brett and Jody and Lindsay for those presentations. We will send around the uh, PowerPoints as well. Um, and yes, just, a, just an extra thank you to everyone who, who tuned in. Um, and to all the attorneys out there who are really thinking about this critically. Um, it's a really, you know, statelessness, um, unfortunately, is still a little known and little understood um, issue, I think, in many and much of uh, the U.S. context. And, you know, it's getting getting attorneys to really raise these issues and understand these issues and, and present them will go a long way towards helping improve protections for stateless people here in the United States. So thank you for your interest in this. Thank you, Jody and Brett, too. I'll just echo uh, Michaela for, for your great work, both in the Jorbina case and as well as um, furthering the, the thoughts and, and representation for stateless people. So just that thank you as well. Thank, well, thank you. you. It's our pleasure to be involved. Okay. All right, everyone. Have a great afternoon. For those of you on the East Coast, hope you get to enjoy a uh, um, a lovely um, after spring or summer afternoon that <laughs> we're having unseasonably. Take good care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.